Good morning. It's good to um, be here together. And it's good to know that in spite of the fact that we can misplace things, <laughs> and sometimes we put them in an unusual place, but that we serve a God who doesn't misplace things and doesn't forget things, knows where each one of us are at every split second of the day and night. Isn't that good? I'm glad that God doesn't have memory problems. <laughs> We're going to start with number 16, which is in our hymn book. It's a chorus, and there's four, four verses to this. But um, we'll sing God is so good, and then we're going to have some prayer after we've sung this through. So God is so good, he's so good to me. and goodness. Help us as we focus on how great you are. Help us to realize that you care about us as individuals. Not only the world all around us, not only the billions of people in this world, but you love each one of us individually. We cannot comprehend that, Lord, but we are grateful for it. And we pray that you help us to realize that you are, you care about us right where we are, in our own families, in our own situations, that you care for us. Help us to, to praise you for that and to trust you because you are so good. And we can put complete confidence and trust in you. And we pray, Lord, today as we focus on how great you are. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to listen to your voice speaking to our hearts. So thank you, Lord, that you don't forget us. You don't forget anything that concerns us, that you know right where we are in every need. And so, Lord, we come together as needy people asking for your great help in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 141, 1 to 21. <clears throat> I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your words to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim, pro, proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. 
The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are, who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. May the Lord bless you. morning, I wish to speak to you from Psalm 145 about the allness of God. That may be a new word in the dictionary, the allness of God, but I had to invent that word because there was no other. Let us pray first of all. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture that's in front of us today. Speak to us from it, we pray through your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. The allness of God. Psalm 145 is the last of the acrostic psalms. Because each verse starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Hence, it is an acrostic psalm. It was written by King David in the latter years of his life as he reflects on and remembers God's dealings with him in all his life. Matthew Henry, the famous Bible commentator, said about this psalm, God's people towards the end of their life should abound much in praise, and the rather because at the end of their life they hope to remove to the world of everlasting praise, and the nearer they come to heaven, the more they should be accustomed or accustom themselves to the work of heaven. In other words, we need to learn to praise God more and more as we get older. Here David is praising God for his hand upon his life. The first thing I want us to notice about this psalm is found in verse 3, which says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable or unfathomable. God's greatness is so deep that we cannot plumb the depths of it. God's greatness is so great that it is unsearchable. We can spend our lives studying the greatness of God and never come anywhere near to finding out all there is. Everything about God is infinite and eternal. And the word eternal, as we mentioned in our I class, according to the dictionary means without beginning or without end. It's a new concept. It's a God word. God is the only one who is eternal. There's nothing in the universe that is eternal except God. There is a word that describes him. An infinite is also a special symbol in mathematics for infinity. God is the only one who is infinite. Space appears to us to be infinite, but it is not. But God is infinite and eternal. And the universe God created is so awesome. Have you ever spent much time studying the universe around you with your own eyes and do your own investigation? and your own enjoyment of it. It's so awesome. If the universe that God created is so awesome, then how much more awesome and great is God himself who created it? I remember as a boy going to a, a boys club, excuse me, a boys club a meeting at the, uh, my words, skip my mind. We watch the stars in space. Observatory. I remember once going to an observatory, I think it was in Melbourne, and looking through a telescope and seeing so much in space. And there was so much to see, you could spend the rest of your life studying it. It is beyond description. So God is great in knowledge, and He knows, 
He's great in his power. He's great in his wisdom. He's great in his holiness. He's great in his practical care of us. He's great in his mercy. Everything about God is great. And he uses his greatness in every way to help everyone. God is not just a God who sits up there and makes rules. He intervenes and helps us right down here. Little are you and me, he helps us. He uses his greatness to help us. And then in verse 5, it says, God is glorious. Verse 5 says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and in your wondrous works. So God is glorious. He is totally praiseworthy and deserving of all human praise because he is pure and holy altogether. According to a Christian dictionary, a dictionary of Bible and Christian doctrine, it says Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of the glory of God. Man has always wondered, what is God like? What does he look like? What does he do? Why did you think? Jesus Christ is that one who show, shows us perfectly the glory of God in flesh. We can see what God is really like. God is glorious in his whole character and all he does. And then in verses, verses 7 and 17 it says that God is good. Hence we sang a chorus this morning, God is so good. Verse 7 says here, And they shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. And then also verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The word good comes from the word God. He sets the standard of all that is good. How do we know what's good and what's bad? God tells us very plainly. And he also defines what is evil. And so God, who is totally righteous by nature, and is also righteous in all he does. Verse 9 says, God is good to all. This is where the allness of God, God is good to all. There's not a man on the face of the earth that can honestly say, God is not good to me. They blame God for all kinds of things. I've heard them. But it's not true. No one can rightly say, the Lord is not good to me. Do we realize, do I realize, that my very life and breath and strength and abilities all come from God and continue to be given to us daily? If I wake up in the morning and I'm still here, that's a gift of God and people don't realize that. The air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat all originate from God. And the bad things that happen to us in life are from other people, or from our own poor choices, or from the devil, not from God. I so much of that being blamed on God. And we live in a fallen world as well that has the consequences of sin. Things like cancer and other horrible diseases. They're not from God. God didn't create cancer. And God did not create the coronavirus either. God is good in nature and all he does. Verse 8 tells us God is gracious. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. That means that the Lord shows his kindness and patience and compassion when we do not deserve it. Or we are slow to learn or stubborn. He knows our human weaknesses and offers us wonderful help. The Apostle Peter said in his uh, second epistle, chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's that word all again, the allness of God. He wants all people 
to accept his offer of help. God is gracious when we don't deserve it. Otherwise, where would any of us be if God wasn't gracious to us? And then in verse 14, there's another thing about God's allness. Verse, eight, uh, verse uh, 14 says, The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord knows that life is tough. The Lord Jesus has lived to himself and he knows all about that by experience. The Lord is gentle. He upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. If you want God's help, it's there for asking. God is gentle with us and patient with us. In fact, I am astonished at how patient God is and how God was patient with the nation of Israel. I mean, I would have given up on Israel long before God did. Yes, he did punish them. Yes, he did chastise them. But he kept hoping and praying that they'd come back. And they were so stubborn, they were fools. But he didn't give up on them. The Lord offers to help all who are struggling with life's woes and burdens. Whoever you are, the Lord offers to help you with no discrimination whatsoever. The Lord Jesus himself in Matthew 11, 28 and 29 invites whosoever will. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy burdened, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, as that word and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. A lot of people are restless and don't even know what they're restless about. They're restless in their souls and they're seeking to find rest and comfort in all kinds of things, but it's not working too well. The Lord Jesus and God himself is gentle toward us. And then in verses 15 and 16, which I will read again, the eyes of the all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. All living things. God is generous. All life on earth depends on God to supply their food and nutrition. <coughs> you know, I know farmers come and do it, manufacturers come and do it, but where does it all come from? come from the hand of God in the first place. <coughs> God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible. The heavens and the earth, the universe and the earth, were created by God and he continues to sustain it by his almighty power. We should never forget that. God once warned Israel that when they came into the promised land and they prospered, he gave them a warning. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 to 18, the scripture says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage or slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents or snakes and scorpions and the thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. I warn them that when they are prosperous, don't think you are so clever that you've got it yourself. God gave you the means to get it. And don't ever forget that. It's the same today. God is generous, and because of his generosity, 
if we can get ahead. And this is the reason behind the reason we need to say grace at every meal. To thank the Lord for his generosity in supplying our food. Just because we can buy our food from IGA, Woolworths, Coles and Aldi, doesn't mean we should not say grace at mealtime. Where do they get the food from? The food processing factory, the farm, the fishermen, and they got it from the ground or the sea, which God supplies and renews and sustains. So we need to say grace and be thankful to God for his generosity towards us. Then verse 20 tells us a very stern warning. I'll read verse 20 again. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. There's two sides of all this there. God, when he punishes the wicked, is in fact giving them up to themselves. He is not giving up on them. God never gives up on anyone. But he's giving them up to themselves. Even though God is good to all, us all, in these many ways we've been talking about this morning, God is not a soft, a soft touch to be abused. In Romans chapter 1, verses 24, 26, 28, and 32, the Apostle Paul explains how very fairly God deals with the wicked. And I'll read those words to you from Romans chapter 1. God also gave them up, those who are wicked, to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Notice the form of punishment. He gave them up to what they were doing, the consequences. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. But even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And then in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So to summarize how God deals with the wicked, they are basically self-condemned because they persistently reject the Lord in their lives. So he gives them over to face the consequences of their own self-chosen evil lifestyle. They end up with what they chose. It is not that God can't save them or won't save them. It's that they don't want to be saved. And that's the judgment they bring on themselves. And in John 3.17 it says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save them. They condemn themselves. So God, even in his judgment of the wicked, is fair. They continue, continue to push God away out of their lives. God says, you won't know. If that's the way you persist in going, I'll let you go that way. But you'll reap, reap the consequences. That's the judgment they bring on themselves. So even in his dealing with the wicked, he's righteous. So what can we say about the allness or the all-inclusiveness of God toward us. God is all-inclusive of every person in the human race to offer everyone his, great, his greatness, his glory, his goodness, his grace, his gentleness and his generosity for our blessing and benefit. In verses 18 to 20 of this psalm, it says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him, and he will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him. And that all means everyone on the face of the earth. No matter what nation, or age, or colour of skin, God's grace is equally given to all. The Lord Jesus himself said similar words in John 3.16. God so loved the world, that means all of it, that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him <coughs> <coughs> should, 
which will not perish but have everlasting life. So the allness, the all inclusiveness of God is so beautiful that He treats us all fairly and He loves us all equally. He is patiently waiting for our response. So I love the allness of God. You know what I mean by that. God is all inclusive and the wicked cut themselves off from the grace of God. And they can come back any time they want to. And God will not turn them away. And we see what happened in real life when Judas rejected the grace of God and he destroyed himself. And Peter disowned the Lord, but he came back and he repented. So you see the two at work. And, and the same on the cross. One thief accepted Jesus, one rejected him. And so if we are judged by God, it's because we bring it on ourselves. God loves us all, and he wants us all to be with him forever. The oldness of God is such a beautiful thing. Let's pray. Our precious Saviour, we thank you that you love us all equally. And you do not discriminate in any way, shape, or form. We pray that you'll help us to love you more and more and help others come to know you for themselves as well. We pray. Thank you, Lord, for your arms of love that reach out to all of us, the whole human race. And the greatest proof of that love, Lord, is Jesus, your Son, dying for us on the cross. And Lord, our very life and breath are in your hands for that we thank you and for all our material needs come from your hand originally we thank you for that also Lord. help us to be always your servants we pray in jesus mighty name amen Pastor Joe, would you come